ACM IEEE Computer Society Ken Kennedy Award honors outstanding contributions to programmability or productivity in high performance computing, together with significant community service or mentoring contributions. This award was established in memory of Ken Kennedy, the founder of Rice University's nationally ranked computer science program and includes a $5,000 honorarium. The 2014 ACM IEEE Computer Society Ken Kennedy Award is presented to Charles Leeserson for his enduring influence on parallel computing systems and their adoption into mainstream use through scholarly research and development, and for distinguished mentoring of computer science leaders and students. Leeserson, a professor of computer science and engineering in the MIT Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, is also the head of the SuperTech Research Group in the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He is the recipient of many academic awards, among them the IEEE CS 2014 Taylor L. Booth Education Award and the ACM 2013 Paris Kanellakis Theory and Practice Award. He is a Margaret McVicker Faculty Fellow at MIT, the highest recognition at MIT for undergraduate teaching. Leeserson is an ACM Fellow, AAAS Fellow, and Senior Member of IEEE and SIAM. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us congratulate the 2014 ACM IEEE Computer Society Ken Kennedy Award winner, Professor Charles Leiserson. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Charles Leiserson, who's this year's winner of the Ken Kennedy Award. He's a professor and Margaret McVicker faculty fellow at MIT, where he spent most, most of his career. The Kennedy Award recognizes outstanding contributions to programmability or productivity in high performance computing, together with significant community service and mentoring contributions. Uh, Charles Leiserson embodies all these the strengths uh, that Ken Kennedy had and are recognized by this award. He's a world-class researcher, and uh, we uh, most recently know him for his work on silk, on work stealing dynamic runtime systems, and on cache oblivious algorithms. But he has a very long history in combining uh, theoretical foundations of parallel computing with uh, things that migrate into practice. Uh, things, uh, there's a very long list, but just a few examples. Uh, fat trees, systolic architectures, um, things like this. He, this, uh, this approach to research was recognized by the IEEE Paris Kanellakis Theory and Practice Award a couple of years ago. Uh, and he's also a, an ACM fellow and a AAAS fellow. Uh, like Kennedy, uh, Charles Leiserson has also had a, a strong relationship with industry and that's how he's been able to migrate his research work into practice. Um, most recently, he's, uh, the, he's worked with Intel uh, to make Silk available, but he also uh, worked at Akamai, and he worked with Thinking Machines uh, on the design of the CM5. Um, also like Kennedy, he's a, an outstanding teacher, uh, and in fact, he won the IEEE Taylor Booth Award that recognizes excellence in teaching. He also uh, has one of the most popular computer science textbooks. He's a co-author of one of the most popular computer science textbooks, The Introduction to Algorithms. And he's an uh, outstanding advisor, and you know, many of his students have gone on to have impact in this field. Um, in addition, he's has a strong uh, community service record. And just a couple of examples, uh, very recently um, led to the creation of the ACM Transactions on Parallel Computing, a new journal in this field. And uh, he's been a spokesperson for the field to government agencies and to uh, technology leaders. In terms of mentoring, he has uh, known for a leadership skills workshop uh, that's very popular. So in short, he embodies all the uh, strengths of Kennedy, and I was a Ken Kennedy student in the late 80s and early 90s, and we read many of Charles' uh, work and that, that of his students as a, uh, when I was uh, being trained by Kennedy, and I know that if he were here today, he would be very proud to see Charles winning this award.
So uh, uh, in closing, I just want to read the citation that the committee uh, wrote for uh, Charles in winning this award. It's for enduring influence on parallel computing systems and their adoption into mainstream use through scholarly research and development and distinguished mentoring of CS leaders and students. So with that, I will turn it over to Charles Eisterson. Wow. Thank you, Mary. That was uh, probably longer than my talk. <laughs> um, somebody dared me to pronounce my title. <laughs> uh, so what is parallelism? Uh, so I really have just three things to talk about uh, today. Whoops, need a... Um, talk about parallelism, talk a little bit about Moore's Law, and then I want to spend a few minutes and talk about Ken Kennedy, because uh, he was, um, had a, had a, uh, had a, heart as big as his uh, brain. And uh, I think that uh, I would not feel right accepting an award uh, with his name on it without saying something about him. And so I have a little bit of a story uh, to tell about Ken. So let's start out with parallelism. Um, I want to start with a simple model of parallelism. I'm predominantly an algorithmist and theorist. And so I like simple models because they cut away the uh, inessentials, and then you can add in the complexities later on to try to understand things better. So in this model, uh, we'll view a parallel computation as a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, uh, each node of which is a strand, which is a serial chain of executed instructions. And there's a dependency between two nodes, A going to B, if B cannot start until A completes. Uh, a fork is any node that has out degree bigger than uh, one. And uh, a join is a node that has an in degree bigger than one. Uh, two things are parallel if there's no path from one to the other in either way. Otherwise, they're in series. This model happens to coincide nicely to the silk model that uh, I have worked on um, mostly uh, for, um, uh, for shared memory uh, multicore processors, but, um, but the, the theory extends to any model that you could represent as a DAG. So here's a quick example of a parallel quicksort. Uh, it basically, uh, if uh, n is bigger than one, it partitions the array A into uh, two parts. It then quick sorts the first part, quick sorts the second part, and returns. But in the parallel implementation, we use two keywords here, silk spawn, which says, uh, which says that the child procedure can execute in parallel with the parent. So while you're quick sorting A of Q minus one, uh, you can also quick sort uh, the, which is the first part of the array, you can also quick sort the second part of the array in parallel and then synchronize. And the synchronize says control doesn't pass this point until all the spawn chi children have returned. So this um, generates essentially a tree of, uh, of computation because it's a recursive program. Uh, but one of the things about this type of program is that it's processor oblivious. There's no mention of processors in it, okay? It's, uh, it just tells you what the logical parallelism is. And Silk has a really neat scheduler, work-stealing scheduler, that maps this computation to available processors at runtime. And so the execution looks something like this, where you uh, execute uh, a node, and uh, then you, you end up, uh, as a result of that, continuing the parent, executing the child, 
they keep spawning and you get a whole tree of computation. So the natural um, question to ask about something like this is um, how parallel is my code? Okay, uh, am I going to use my processing resources effectively? Should I expect it to scale up? You know, can I get linear speed up? And uh, by the way, when I'm saying how parallel is it, what is parallelism anyway? Now, almost every time I see somebody talking about parallelism, the very next thing that comes up is a picture of Gene Amdahl. Uh, in 1967, he formulated a law that, that I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, says, well, if a quarter of your application is serial and 75 is parallel, you can't get more than a factor of four speed up, no matter how many processors you run on. Okay, or in general, if a fraction alpha of your application must be run serially, then the speed up is at most one over alpha. And the argument is very simple. It just says, look, suppose the parallel stuff took no time. Okay, the serial stuff still has to go on. You're only going to get a speed up of one over alpha. Okay? So that's all well and good, but Amdahl's law doesn't actually quantify parallelism. And it turns out there's a very old theory that has, was started in the 1960s at around the same time, which actually leads to a quantification of parallelism. And it's a, it's, I'm continually stunned that more people don't know it. And so I thought it's such a simple theory. Let me just throw it out here. And uh, some people probably know it. And those who don't know it, they'll have something to learn. So the idea here is to, uh, let's use a little notation. Let's let TP be the execution time of the application on P processors, okay? Now there's two measures that are sort of independent of P. And that's the case when, when P equals one, that's the serial execution time, and we call that the work. And so the work is just simply, in the simple model, uh, how much time it would take to execute this whole thing serially. Okay, in this case, I've made the assumption that each strand executes in unit time, but it doesn't matter. You can have it execute longer, uh, uh, and, and everything works out. And in this case, it's 18 for this particular graph. The other measure is what happens if you happen to have an infinite number of processors. And let's theoretically make the assumption that, hey, I can schedule all those infinite processors and there's no overhead. Then what you discover is, well, uh, there's a critical path in the code, and that even if you have a large parallel application, if, uh, if, if, there's, a, if there's a long path, You've got to, even with the infinite number of processors, have to march all the way along that path. Okay, and we call that the span. In this case, it's nine. Okay. Now, there's two fundamental laws that I think are more basic than Amdahl's law that express, uh, from which we can get a quantification of parallelism. The first is the work law, and it simply says that with an infinite number, sorry, with um, p processors, the time can't, has to be at least as long as T1 over P. And the reason for this is that if you're doing P work at a time, if you've gone less than T1 over P steps, you haven't done all the work. The second law is the span law, and it says with a finite number of processors, you can't go faster than if you had an infinite number. Okay, so that's the span law. The work law, the span law, together, Okay, we're going to use those to get some very interesting bounds. So the first thing is to understand speed up. Speed up is how much faster you are with P processors than with one. Now, if, uh, as is common in uh, people uh, trying to parallelize their code, okay, if the speed up is less than P, we have sublinear speed up. We don't like that. Okay, because that means you're not using all the P processors. What we prefer is to have linear speed up, that T1 over P is equal to, T1 over TP is equal to P. We used all our processors effectively. I went, I threw P processors at it, it went P times faster. And then in this model, uh, we cannot have that it's greater than P. That's super linear speed up. It is possible in some other models where, for example, you take caching and things like that into effect. 
but basically in this model that's not passable. So now the parallelism is what is the fastest given, um, uh, uh, what is the fastest that you could make any uh, computation go, no matter how many processors? Okay, so the maximum speed up is going to be T1 over T infinity. You can't go faster because the span law says that TP is at least as big as T infinity. Okay, so T, this is the parallelism. It's the average amount of work per step along the span. Okay, and in this case, it's 18 divided by 9 as we had computed. Okay, and that's just 2. So I often at, quiz my students, how much parallelism do you think is in this computation? Very few people guess that it's as low as 2. Because it looks like there's all this stuff going on. And what this says is that using more than two processors to execute the computation guarantees wastefulness. You're not going to get linear speed up if you use more than two processors. Now, in the Silk scheduler, we have a scheduler that actually has a theorem that goes along with it. And it says, well, there's these two lower bounds from the work law and from the span law. And essentially, the sum of them, with a little bit of constant on one of them, is an upper bound. Okay? And that's very good news. Because a corollary says that you get near linear speed up as long as you're executing a computation where the parallelism in the computation exceeds the number of processors. Okay, so the parallelism is T1 over T infinity. It's much bigger than P. And the proof is fairly simple. Okay, so the parallelism being bigger than P is equivalent to saying that T infinity is much less than T1 over P. Well, if, if T1 over P is much less than T infinity, then the order T infinity is small compared to T1 over P. So the performance is then just T1 over P and the speed up is then P. Very simple argument, okay? Now, one of the nice things about having a theory is you can put theories into tools. And for Silk, we have a tool called SilkView that can measure the parallelism of an application. Okay, so for example, here's the parallelism of, uh, of um, quicksort, and it produces this kind of graph where it'll benchmark the computation and tell you what the measured speed up is for your program, in this case, the quicksort, okay? It gives you the line which is the work line, the linear speed up line, and it gives you the parallelism, okay, which is the amount that you can't exceed and uh, prints out that number. In this case, for uh, 100 million elements to sort, the parallelism was 21.31. Uh, it also gives you another number which helps you to understand whether scheduling overheads might be involved, okay? Not only can you do this with a tool, you can do this mathematically. You can do what's called work span asymptotic analysis, okay? And you can write down recurrences, and I'm not gonna go through this, but um, you can write down recurrences and solve for work and span compute the parallelism. In this case, it turns out that your parallelism is order log n for quicksort, okay? And what that means is that even if you have a really big input, you're only going to see li linear speed up if you're running on relatively few processors or log the size of the uh, thing. There are faster sorting algorithms in practice, okay? But the simple theory is very, very powerful. And it permits you to do what I would call science-based performance analysis. If you know the work and span, you can compute parallelism and predict what your application scales. Performance composes. When you call something as a subroutine, you don't have to worry about what resources it's using or whatever. You just compose, whether serially or in, in series or in parallel, you can compose the work and span. And if your code does not scale, because you probably aren't working on an ideal computer, okay, you know that insufficient parallelism isn't the cause, and you can do the detective work to figure out what does matter. So the SilkView tool, for example, will diagnose insufficient parallelism and scheduling overhead, and if neither of those is issue, you can start looking at things like memory bandwidth and contention. So that's what parallelism is. 
And now I want to try to tell you why I think it's important. Um, I may not have too many people to convince in this crowd, but, uh, but we have a, a really interesting thing happening with Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is an economic and technology trend originally formulated in 1965 by Intel founder Gordon Moore. Um, and it was christened by uh, Carver Mead, who's a Caltech prof professor in 1975. Now, there's a popular version of Moore's Law, which essentially says that the cost of computing drops exponentially year by year. And that's actually an implication of the real Moore's Law. But when I've talked with people about it, most people seem to think that the popular one is the real one. It's not, OK? And it's what's responsible for taking the connection machine CM5, on which I was the network architect, okay, and making it be essentially equivalent in power today, this, this laptop here, okay, is, is essentially the same, uh, it's like within a factor of three, for $1,500 rather than $47 million. Okay, so really dramatic, dramatic change over the last uh, 20 years or so. Now, the original Moore's Law, Gordon Moore said, the complexity for minimum co component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. What he means by that is the number of transistors has been doubling every year okay, on a chip. And he provided a plot to show that. He actually had to correct himself 10 years later. And this is the real Moore's Law. He says, the new slope might approximate a doubling every two years rather than every year by the end of the decade. And indeed, if you plot the Intel processors as an example, uh, we have, uh, in a period of 40 years, uh, increased things by a factor of a million, okay? And so, uh, which is uh, six orders of magnitude. And that computes out to a rate of doubling every two years, okay? So the impact has been that we get lots of cheap computing. For 50 years, we can just look out and get something every uh, year. It's a printing press okay, for processor cycles. Really remarkable. 50 years. And it's about to end. Lots of people in the technology area predicting it. Perhaps one of the most articulate people has been uh, Bob Colwell, who was the chief architect for the Intel Pentium and was a director of the DARPA Microsystems Technology Office in 2000. In, uh, uh, Microsystems Technology Office. And in 2013, here's what he said. He said, for planning horizons, I picked 2020 as the earliest date we could call Moore's Law dead. Okay, and he said, if you push him, you could talk me into 2022, two more years. Okay, it's right around the corner. It's the end of this decade. Okay, at this point, it's almost like five years away. Okay, the party's gonna end. Okay. Why does the party have to end? It's been so good. We've been having a great time. We've gotten all the things we want. We've got drug discoveries. We've got simulating uh, galaxies and so forth. Why does the party have to end? Well, the first reason is physics. It's implausible that semiconductor technologists can make wires thinner than atoms, OK? And atoms are only a few angstroms across. The current feature size is 14 nanometers, okay, as in the Intel Core M processor. That's 140 angstroms. We are close, okay? And they're not gonna get anywhere close to just a few angstroms. Most technology roadmaps see an end around five nanometers, which if you work it out, turns out to be about six years. And the other thing that's going on is economics. Even if you could push it further, it starts to become prohibitively costly. So this, is, this, this ride we've been on, it's ending. Okay? We are so close to the end. 
But that doesn't say anything about the popular Moore's law. Are there replacement technologies that can continue to com drive computing costs down for years to come? I believe the answer is yes. Okay, we can still drive computing costs down. But semiconductor physics and silicon fabrication technologies won't help us much anymore. They did their jobs. Okay? Instead, most of the improvement in, uh, in cost performance is going to come from computer science. Okay? And it's going to come from core areas in computer science, things like architecture, programming languages, compilers, systems, algorithms, applications, and tools. Very familiar stuff. But we're no longer going to be racing Moore's law. Moore's law is not going to be racing this kind of technology. Okay? And because of the nature of these sorts of things, this is not going to be broad-based. So Moore's law moved everything forward. Okay? In this case, everything is not going to move forward. If you make an algorithmic improvement, you change something in this little corner. If you make a compiler improvement, you change it for these people who need that compiler feature. So it's going to go ahead in fits and starts. It's going to be much more niche-based uh, and opportunistic moving, uh, moving uh, along. Okay? Now, there's no need to panic okay, about the end of Moore's Law, but there are things that we must do if we want to continue to enjoy the fruits of ever cheaping computer. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is we have to redress our legacy of excess. Okay? We have been putting so much bloat into our systems, okay? and we have to get rid of that bloat. Okay? There's very few uh, programs out there. Since time to market is so important and performance has been coming for free from Moore's Law, there's no reason for people to really think very carefully about their code and to optimize it so that most software systems, even the hardware, has lots of bloat, lots of inefficiency. The second thing is that we need to build scalable systems. We will not be able to make things more dense. So this community is working on exactly the right stuff. How do you make things scale uh, with multi-chip systems and scalable systems? You guys are ahead of the curve. I should say we're ahead of the curve. I think it's also important, though, to work on making our computer systems better behaved. There's an awful lot of uh, ad uh, hockery, if you will, uh, in the implementations of our systems. Things that make it so you can't figure out where the performance is going, okay? Or why I did this and then I made this same little change to my program and suddenly it's twice as slow, and so forth. We have to work on making those things much more smooth and much easier to, to, to work on. I think also we have to worry about things like making our performance engineering science-based rather than a black art so that you can actually do the measurements and so forth to make code go faster, okay, so that, that things are reliable. And I think we have to work very hard on education. Okay, including parallelism. Most, d despite this community, most people out there do not know how to program in parallel. Okay, and they didn't really have to because Moore's Law was helping them. Well, at this point, we're at the point where we have lots of parallelism on our chips and we're just not using it. Bloat. We need to educate people in, in that. So now let me get off my uh, high horse and talk about somebody who um, was uh, a really spectacular human being, Ken Kennedy. Um, Mary read this, this little thing, and what I'd like to point out here is, so he was a brilliant fellow, okay, uh, but he was also, the, the award recognizes mentoring and uh, community service. And so I want to tell a little story about my experience with Ken mentoring me. So eight years ago, out of the blue, Ken sends me this message. He says, Charles, 
It has come to my attention that you are not an ACM fellow. This strikes me as an unbelievable oversight on somebody's part. If someone is nominating you this year, I would like to support it. If not, I would like to nominate you. What's the story here? Now you have to understand, I knew Ken a, a bit, you know, but, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't get a degree at Rice. You know, I, uh, we never cross paths except professionally, okay? This is like out of the blue. And I'm thinking, Ken Kennedy wants to nominate me, wow. Ken is a big shot, okay? So here he is in Washington. You probably recognize Al Gore. Anybody see Ken in the picture? Okay, there he is, sitting right next to Al Gore, okay? Advancing the HPC agenda. This community would not be what it is today if Ken had not gone to Washington and made stuff happen for all of us, okay? He was a very giving individual, okay? So when somebody like that says, I'd like to nominate you for uh, ACM Fellow, you sort of say, I'd be honored, <laughs> okay? if you'd nominate me. Now, it also happened that I knew that at the time he was uh, coping with, uh, with cancer treatment. He had pancreatic cancer, okay? And so I said, I hope you know, that's going, you know, going well. I've heard good news uh, recently from a friend. Well, over the next week, Ken asked me for this, and he asked me for that, and he does this and that, and I start to realize Oh my God, he's putting in an awful lot of work for this nomination. Okay, he wants to make it good. It's like, where does he get the energy? My goodness. He's doing a lot of work. So I say, Ken, many thanks for your support. I appreciate the time you're putting in. Okay, and Ken's response was, thanks and no problem. Part of being a reasonable, uh, a responsible senior citizen, so to speak. Okay, thoughtful and gracious. Okay. Okay. A few uh, months later, Ken's hard work pays off for me. Okay, not for him. I don't see what he got out of this. Okay, except knowing that he was doing a good thing. That's why I. That's why I really feel compelled to to tell the story. Okay. He says, Charles, I just learned that you've been named an ACM fellow. Congratulations. Okay. I mean, this was all Ken's work. And then, eleven weeks later. Ken dies of his cancer, age 61. I'm 61 right now. Just had my birthday last week, much too early. So now we skip forward a little bit in the story to when the uh, Kennedy Award was announced. And uh, I started getting people saying congratulations and you know, Ken was great and you know, it's great that you're gonna have an award with his name on it. And in particular, I got one from Michael Scott at University of Rochester, well known for his work on concurrency. Michael says, um, hi Charles, just saw the news, congratulations, an honor richly deserved. And my response was, Michael, thanks very much. It's particularly an honor to have an award with Ken Kennedy's name on it. He went out of his way to help younger people in the field, including me. And then Michael sends the following response. He says, indeed, I knew him only casually, but he is the one who put me up for ACM fellow. And so Ken was out there looking for junior people to promote, okay? Just without any thought of reward and while he was dying of cancer. And so I couldn't give a Ken Kennedy lecture without, um, saying something about Ken, and uh, for those of you who never knew him, you really missed a, uh, uh, a wonderful person, and a person who, who did a lot to make this community what it is today. So uh, that completes my talk, thank you. <laughs>